So, wow. So, uh, this is great. Just delighted to see everybody here. So, um, let me just start with some readings here. This is from the Bible. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. That was from 2 Corinthians. And then from Science and Health, willingness to become as a little child and to leave the old for the new renders thought receptive of the advanced idea. Gladness to leave the false landmarks and joy to see them disappear. This disposition helps to precipitate the ultimate harmony. This purification of sense and self is a proof of progress. And then hymn 258, the second verse. New occasions teach new duties. Time makes ancient creeds uncouth. They must upward still and onward, who would keep abreast of truth. And serenely down the future, see the thought of men incline to the side of perfect justice and to God's supreme design. And then from 2 Corinthians again. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want. And from Science and Health, each successive stage of experience unfolds new views of divine goodness and love. This is an element of progress, and progress is the law of God, whose law demands of us only what we can certainly fulfill. What we need most is the prayer of fervent desire for growth and grace, expressed in patience, meekness, love, and good deeds. And from Psalms. O oh, sing unto the Lord a new song. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. And science and health. To those leaning on the sustaining infinite, today is big with blessings. So again, Thank you so much for coming. We're going to have a we're going to have a good time here. I can tell you, uh, it's so it's so much fun to come back here. I was here, as you know, for a few weeks on and off, and I just got to know so many of you, and just so much fun to see so many familiar faces. So it's just great to be here. And everybody on Zoom, glad you're on. This is just great. Well, I would like to start off to uh, by introducing members of the board and. Uh, I would just ask you all to come up. I'm going to disappear behind this curtain. You'll probably be glad for that. Um, so let me just do that as you all come up here, and then I'll introduce you one by one. So come on down. This, I feel like Monty Hall. <laughs> all right. Uh, if each of you would just raise your hand as I call your name out, that way the good folks on Zoom can see who you are. So John Bryant, Secretary from Los Alamitos. I assume there's a hand up. Yes, there he is. Okay. And then Dave Cook is Vice Chair and also our board member at large. He's a big guy, so that's that's good. Uh, uh, and so he he's right here, as you know. Um, and then Doreen Ford with Lena Miguel. Okay. And then Greg Yeoman, treasurer from Irvine. And our newest board member is Elizabeth McElroy Jones from Fort Lauderdale. Yes. Okay. And that came with a recommendation from our uncle, Tom McElroy. Is Tom here? Okay. All right. And then finally, some of you may remember this guy. Uh, from Lake Forest, he was our director of finance here at the Willows, and that's Tom Sebring. Diana. 
Okay, now I'm going to ask you to, uh, unless you want to stay up for a while, but if we can so, get off, yeah, if you can get off, and I'll just do my thing here. Thank you. And this is the Wizard of Oz. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> See what we have to work with. <laughs> All right. Now, before I go any further, I, I just want to acknowledge some of the contributions, and essentially the legacy left here by Todd, whose life was celebrated two weeks ago. As you know, Todd was a good friend of mine. I knew him for 17 years. And I just want to kind of just say a couple of things. You know, he was a guy that uh, probably one of the strongest strategic thinkers I have ever met. He could frame an issue like nobody else. And uh, under his watch, you know, he really worked with this community to get everyone through COVID. And I think uh, he was largely responsible on his watch for many of the upgrades we had, both in the welcome center, which we welcome, no pun intended, and then next door in the dining room. So I just really want to acknowledge Todd for what he did for the time that he was here. So thank you. You know, um, Todd also built a good team. There are three people that joined this past year. So uh, if these three people would please stand up. Deanna Heath, they don't want to come up on stage. Deanna, okay. Deanna Heath is our marketing and development director. And does anybody not know Lance Thornton at this point? I mean, this guy is all over the place, right? He was our dining services director, Lance. You got to stand up. All right. All right. And Heidi, Heidi Heinbaugh is everywhere. And she is our activities and events director. It's great. Well, um, I just want to introduce one other person here, and I think everybody knows him by this time. Uh, and that's Steve DeWitt. He's our new executive director. For those of you who don't know, especially on Zoom here, brings a wealth of experience from the for-profit world. He was with Disney, Intel, Morgan Stanley. So you've got three really interesting uh, industries there, finance, technology, and entertainment. He's a lifelong CS, and uh, he's married to Sabrina. They both are leaders down here from the Green Mount Miguel Church. Uh, Steve is also a Penn grad and on their board of trustees. So... We're just really thrilled to have you on board here, Steve. So you'll hear a lot more from him once, once I get the hook here. Um, welcome, Steve. I tell you, it is fun working with this guy. We, we do talk fairly frequently, and I will tell you, I never know where we're going, but it's always good. And it's just been exciting to see his energy and I think the thought that's really going to be bringing this uh, energy and some new horizons here that I think it's going to be an exciting time. Just glad to be part of it. So um, let me just add a couple of remarks here. Today, we have a longer wait list of folks wanting to live here at the Willows than we have ever had before. And I mean, isn't that something? Yeah, I think that's worth it. Okay. And, and the interesting thing is that we've got greater demand, but the fact is the awareness of this place is just very, very low. I'm constantly explaining to people in Boston and the whole Northeast what in the world the Willows is. It, you know, it's not a five bed unit, a facility. I mean, it is, it is a, this is, this is terrific. So I just wanna say, the fact that we've got that wait list and people are really willing to come in here and share this experience, it just speaks to the quality of life now in this grace-led community. So on behalf of the board, we thank you for making the Willows your home and for making it the wonderful experience that it is now and the promise of what this community is going to become. So thank you all. Yeah. So now I'd like to introduce Doug Yeoman, who is our uh, board member, finance committee chair, and then he will bring up Esteban. Oh, thank you. Welcome everyone again. Um, 
I'll begin by reading the first two verses of hymn 46 from the Christian Science Hymnal. And this hymn is very important, very dear to me, blessed to my parents. And as a lifelong Christian scientist, church organist since I was 11 years old, um, <laughs> this is very meaningful and it's very appropriate. Day by day, the manna fell. Oh, to learn this lesson well, still by constant mercy fed. Give me, Lord, my daily bread. Day by day, the promise reads, daily strength for daily needs. Cast foreboding fears away. Take the manna of today. It's my great pleasure to continue witnessing the ever lasting unfoldment of one of the purest forms of good, progress. The Willows has demonstrated that, that following the law of God ensures the abundant supply we need to accomplish all of our goals and more. Our primary goals for fiscal year 2022 were to make an investment in the well-being of our residents, enhance the staff experience, and lastly, maintain and improve our property. At the beginning of the year, it was still uncertain if the many limitations and regulations caused by the world pandemic were going to affect our overall operation. Battling supply chain delays for housing materials, the rise of inflation across all industries, and the high demand for contractors all pose challenges while also providing abundant opportunities for prayer. As a result of our prayers and hard work, we were able to accomplish our goals thanks to our talented staff and the extensive generosity of our donors. As you'll see in the financial report to follow that Esteban will be giving, our donors play a vital role in the welfare of our community for which we are extremely grateful. First, we successfully brought back community events, bus outings, and reopened our ever popular Saturday brunches which from what I heard yesterday, we had over 70 people at it. So it's very popular. We made it a goal to focus on the well-being of our residents by expanding our staff, improving the quality of our services and enhancing the overall resident experience. Second, we invested in the well-being of our staff. We brought back employee holiday events, implemented inflation reduction programs, and invested in the overall safety, technology infrastructure, and professional development of our beloved workers. And third, we are able to improve our property by remodeling numerous garden villas, resulting in an increase in our occupancy rate from 80% to over 89% today. In other words, we increase the occupancy by 11 leased units. Furthermore, we allocated funds to enhance our garden villas by replacing various HVAC systems and repiping them, guaranteeing the long-term operation efficiency of these villas for both existing and prospective residents. Our goal of increasing the number of leased villas and enhancing the brand of our community has led us to a noticeable increase in the demand, as Rich already has indicated, for our beautiful homes and what we market as the Willows experience. As we move forward, we will continue to prioritize the needs and requests of our residents and staff, taking steps towards sustainable upward progress. On behalf of the board, I want to thank you all for your support, prayers, and contributions to the Willows community, and we look forward to carrying our mission forward for many years to come. And with that, I will turn this over to Esteban. Please notice that the three finance guys, Tom, Doug, and I, without telling each other, wore blue ties today. So we're in sync. Thank you, Douglas. Good afternoon, everyone. The next few slides provide an overview of the financial statements from the past fiscal year, and will be compared to the year before. And I'll highlight the key points. During the last fiscal year, our main financial focus was to allocate funds strategically to invest in our residents, in our staff, 
our property, and our investments. When we created this budget, we knew that the pandemic had created a long period of uncertainty and isolation, which in turn created a demand for active communities like ours. Therefore, we knew that we had a great opportunity to attract more residents by investing in remodeling our garden villas, resulting in an increase in rentable inventory. Furthermore, as the world opened its doors to social activities and in-person interactions, we started creating marketing content that showed the world how active, energetic, and spiritual we are here at the Willows. These efforts helped us attract more interest, which then resulted in our occupancy rate going up by 9% from the beginning of the fiscal year to today. Our Willowite population today is the highest we've seen in the past four years. Additionally, we knew that in order to service our residents better, we had to invest in our staff. We increased wages and benefits to retain and attract talent. We invested in training employees to fulfill their potential. And we added staff and consultants where there were gaps in our services. Some examples of areas that were improved were development, dining services, information technology, and communication. The physical, mental, emotional, and metaphysical effort of our managers and their staff resulted in a wonderful fiscal year. Now, let's review our statement of financial position. As you can see in line one and two, highlighted in yellow, we decreased our cash holdings and increased our investment holdings. This was a conscious effort to invest in the financial stewardship of the foundation and to ensure the development of a nest egg for the future. Something important to note is the value of our fixed assets, which is composed by our land, our buildings, and our equipment. Highlighted in orange, you will see that the value is $4.6 million. Now this is the book value, an accounting term that shows the original value that has been depreciating over time. Not to be confused with the market value, which is the value that our assets would sell in today's market. And believe me, the market value is much higher than the book value. <laughs> our secured deposits in line nine of our statement, highlighted in blue, show an increase from last year. Even though this is an accounting liability, it aligns with our objective to increase our occupancy. The higher the number of deposits, deposits held translates to a higher number of villas leased. Another important point I'd like to highlight about our operations is the lack of long-term liabilities. What this means is we operate debt-free. We, we own our property free and clear, and we don't have any active loans. The bottom line highlighted in green shows an overall healthy increase in the value of our net assets due to the many improvements that we made to our property. This include replacing 64 of the 152 residential HVAC systems, repiping 98 of the 152 units, remodeling seven villas, and finally turning over 15 villas. Now, let's proceed to review the statement of activities. Our rental income highlighted in yellow increased by almost $120,000 a year since last year. This is to, due to the welcoming of many more residents to our beloved community. We also experienced a healthy increase in the usage of our services to residents. We had an overall, overall increase in our dining room attendance and meal consumption. Last year, we prepared and sold 15,499 meals. Again, 15,499 three course homemade tasty meals. You can't go wrong with pork chop, right? Additionally, we increased our housekeeping usage from 46 to 56% of our residents. Our housekeepers performed 2,000 
215 hours of residential cleaning without including the buildings and the campus. You really can't beat $25 an hour. Highlighted in orange, you will find our other income. This category is composed of any other income that we generate apart from our operating income and donations. We are blessed to continue receiving aid from the government in the form of employee retention tax credits, otherwise known as ERTC. This aid helped us retain our beloved employees and provide them with the tools they need to succeed. Now, this is my favorite part of fiscal year 22. In line five, highlighted in green, you'll find God's unconditional and unquestionable everlasting supply. We're eternally grateful to have received $1.9 million in donations last year. The unequivocal support that we received from our donors has allowed us to make paramount prog progress here at the Willows. Thank you for those who donated their prayers and their funds to support our mission. These donations also helped offset our investment loss of $314,000. As most of you know, 2022 was not the best year for that. Overall, our total revenue was $4.7 million, 5% higher than last year. Now, just like with great power comes great responsibility, with great donations comes great spending. Our total expenses, expenses for the year amounted to $4 million, $4,300,000. According to the auditors, the most ethical nonprofits in the United States allocate 85% of their spending to what they call the program. In other words, the mission of the company. And the rest of the funds, they spend on admin expenses and fundraising expenses. Here at the Willows, we allocated 84% of our spending to the program. Making sure we dedicate the most of our spending to the well-being of our residents, staff, neighbors, and guests is of most importance to us. Lastly, the bottom line shows that we, that all of the above demonstrations resulted in a net profit of $330,000 this year. By the way, we budgeted a $1.1 million loss. There's our manner. Over we are a financially healthy organization and we can expect that to continue many years to come so that you and your family can further enjoy life at the Willows. Now I'll pass this back to Steve for his executive director report. Thank you very much. Okay, whose phone? This one yours? No, it will be yours. I will leave it alone, sir. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Great to see you all. And excuse me, I'm going to use this mic. Instead of that one. And hopefully you can hear me okay. Or not as well. Okay, we'll forget this then. And we'll use this again. Anyway, hello again. Um, for those of you that haven't heard me talk before, um, I get all over the place. I will apologize right now, but I also am very excited about what I'm doing now. This was something I had no idea I would be doing. It is not something I planned upon. I have never trained, been educated, or anything else for nonprofits. All of my career has been spent in the for-profit area, and it has been all over the place. Uh, well, no, it has been. Lots of different industries, lots of different geographies, lots of different personalities. Um, 
So one of the things that I've been asked to remind you all, if you've got any questions, when we're all done here, come seek us out and talk to us. We would prefer not to take time here because frankly, the, I think you'd much rather hear Richard Davenport talking about stuff metaphysically. Oh, I'm already getting head shaking there. Yes. Thank you very much, Steve. Are you done yet? So feel free to seek us out. We're happy to talk about whatever you want, um, as long as it's about the willows. And uh, we will provide you with whatever answers we think we might know. Let's go to the next slide. So a couple of things. You've just gotten a whole bunch of numbers. Um, a statement actually went through and described them very clearly, but it's a lot of numbers. I understand that. I'm gonna give you my take and boil it down. Firstly, our, just recently, um, our auditors came through and edit, audited all of our books and we got a clean bill of health, which is always a big um, but let me now sort of walk you through all of those numbers and put them into some kind of context for you. Next slide, please. First was operational income. You may not have known that we generate this much revenue here. For those of you that can't see it, it's about two and three quarters million. Nice big number. However, not nearly big enough. Next slide. Because as you probably see, to generate that income, we spend a lot more money than we actually receive back. We lose money. But guess what? We are a not-for-profit organization. So the fact that we lose money is not a surprise. It's in the business plan. That's okay. But it is sizable. And it happens every year. We, when finance just went through and explained, yes, but we made a profit, that's after some other stuff that comes along. So I just want you to understand, operationally, we lose money. And again, it's okay. This isn't a problem as long as we understand that. Next slide. So the, if you take away, if you take the income and take away those expenses, we lost about $1.6 million just in doing our business, in providing places to stay, in having a nice facility, in providing meals, in having events, all of that, we lose money. Then again, that's okay. Next slide. Why is it okay? Because people love this place and they love it with their wallets. It's delightful to receive this kind of money. Understand though, uh, where it comes from. Those donations, let, let me have one more slide. That's right. So those donations are one thing. We also took advantage of a program that was put into place by the US government during the pandemic. If you kept your employees on and kept paying them, you could receive a tax credit. And we did to the tune of almost $300,000. Awesome. One time, we are not expecting this next year. So that's a $300,000 donation that we can't sort of count on next year. The donations that we got, just so you know, one was a huge bequeath that we did not know was coming. It was over a million dollars. Another comes from a very large donor who absolutely believes in the Willows, what we are doing, and we have a great relationship with them. They sort of, we, we sort of say, this is what we're, we'd sort of like from you and where we'd like to apply it. And they have been saying, great, Let, just keep us apprised. So we go ahead and work on some stuff and they go, great, here's some money to cover that. We go off and do some more, great, here's some more money to cover it. It's awesome. 
and we've been asking for a certain kind of amount, I'm going to be exploring vastly more with this same organization and see what that feels like. I'll come back to that in a minute. But that's sort of where we are. Oh, and I should say, so we also got a few more donations in from some other organizations. And then we have a tiny amount, which, which is less than half a percent of sort of people, normal people just sending us some money. You know, a hundred bucks here, 50 bucks there, 10 bucks here, 3000 here, whatever. That all adds up to less than half a percent of our total donations. So most of our donations come from big chunks. And I'll cover that again in a minute. Next one. So overall, and then there's one more, I think, yes. So these come back to the numbers that Esteban just showed you, where $640,000 operational income. And then if you take out of that, our investment loss, we actually had a positive year. Absolutely great, very commendable, wonderful. But as a business person, I'm still a little itchy over it. So let's go to the next slide. Thank you, heal it. This is why I would like my walk around mic. <laughs> Heal it. I like that. So don't apologize. That was a good line. I'll probably use it sometime. And it's absolutely right, which I'll get into in a minute. One of the things that, uh, based on sort of the way our numbers flow, and based on just my feel since I've been here, oh, I should mention, this is week seven for me. So I am still very much a newbie. Um, I do not, we, my wife Sabrina and I, do not live on campus yet. We have chosen a unit. I think even the unit may have chosen us as well, but we're in the queue to get stuff done like a whole bunch of other people. So trust me, the, the executive director does not get special treatment here. And uh, so we're waiting for stuff to happen to it. And sometimes that means waiting for materials, we'll see. Um, but the big thing for me that just is very clear is the wellness is a gift. It's a gift to all the residents from everybody that has given money. It's a gift to the community from the residents. It's a gift to the Christian science movement. And therefore, it's a gift to the world. But I think oftentimes we just think about this place as this cool little sort of corner in South Orange County, and that's it. Let me share with you, I was talking to somebody the other day. I used to serve on the board of uh, Principia's board of trustees with him. He turned out there, and but he's still a very good friend. And he serves on the board of one of our biggest donors, which is a foundation who don't like to be named. Hence, I'm using, you know, the donor who must not be named. Um, and what he told me the other day was that he said, it just feels like there's sort of a stirring of thought at the Willows when he's come to visit. And he said, I could see this place becoming sort of a metaphysical hotbed of activity on the West Coast. And I asked him, cool, but why just... Okay, I'm not thinking big enough either. So it is a gift. This is not a traditional elder care business. Yes, we lose money in our basic business, but so what? We are here to get growth going. We're here to grow ourselves. That's why we're all here. That's what attracts people. It's this attitude on campus. 
And that's why I'm here. I, I had no idea that I was going to end up working here. Always having worked in the for-profit world, not non-profit. I was retired, granted, third time. But um, I was not planning on going back to work. And through an interesting situation, namely my wife just asking me an innocent question while she was on the phone, would I ever consider that? And of course I said, no way. And God spoke differently and said, yes, you need to think about this. And in throwing it back at her, yes, but what about you? You have lived there before, you know excuse me, you know what it's like, would you work there and live there, not work there, would you live there? And she said, no. <laughs> yes. And here we are. Again, we, we didn't expect this, but I don't know if anybody expects the Willows. Person after person that I've talked to who work here, it's a little fuzzy why they're here, but once they're here, it's very clear. And same thing with a bunch of residents that I've talked to. They're sort of surprised they're here. We've got some new residents who are signing up that I'm aware of because I've been involved in their interview process and their sort of onboarding, well, not onboarding, but at least talking to them. And they are stunned that they're joining the community, but they cannot wait. Their families cannot wait. And it isn't because they're a pain. It's because the, the children see the opportunity for their parents here. The children see and have felt the kind of thought that is going on here. I don't know if you all are truly aware of what this place is like for people who are elsewhere and get a chance to come on here. It's like a breath of fresh air. It's like a glass of cool water when it's really hot. It is awesome. So we need to work at that. And I don't have any big announcements for you right now. Well, you've been here seven weeks already. Come on. Let's change stuff up. Maybe. I can tell you one thing we are going to do is lean more heavily into metaphysics. That doesn't mean across absolutely everything we do, but it's very clear just based on the response back there, people want that. And you all are qualified. So I don't know what we're going to do with that. But just imagine harnessing that collective metaphysical might and taking on some of the problems of the world. Maybe right outside our gates, maybe on the other side of the planet. Don't know. But I do know we collectively are not thinking big enough. It's one of the challenges that I've thrown down for the staff, for my team, which is we do not think big enough. So I've asked people, we need to pull together budgets. Yes, they're already in there, but they only go a certain time and they're designed by finance which is awesome because we have to report stuff that way. It doesn't work for me strategically thinking. If we're going to go out and fix some of the one big operational hole, which I see, which is fundraising, to do it, we need to have a better grasp of what our needs are for much longer in the future. Instead of us planning one-year things, I want a five-year thing and a 10-year thing. And instead of thinking, I want 
what we asked from our major donor last year, and let's add maybe five or six percent. I want to say, suppose that they said, have whatever you want. Think about that. Have whatever you want. And let's say you're in charge of buildings. So Dan, anything you want. Oh, I'd like to get all of the next year's worth of air conditioners bought and paid for. Well, how many are you going to need in the next 10 years? Let's just get them all done. Why not? I think God can afford it. Jay, if, if you were given free reign on things that we need to do with our landscaping, what? Think about it. Well, I'd like to replace all of the irrigation stuff. Now you're starting to talk. Okay, and what else? Heidi, what kind of... Oh, poor woman, she's back here running everything. She hears her name. What, what, what? I'll take care of it for you. In fact, I've already done it. I know. I'm sorry. I should have used somebody else. I gave the woman quite a start there. Let's just assume that we had somebody doing events whose name was Heidi. Look, if, if you had an open budget, what would you do? Heidi, your voice has changed. But somebody's getting the idea, right? What else would we do? And we're going through each group and we're asking, what would we do if money was not an issue? What would we do? And so we are putting together a very different kind of budget. And I want to know, let, let's suppose we replace all the roofs. Awesome. Great. When do we need to have new ones? Let's make sure we build that in to whatever our next budget is in the appropriate time frame. Let's be thinking in terms of an unlimited opportunity here. Let's practice Christian science. Let's not just play at it. Let's practice it. And while we're at it, let's expect good. This is Christian science. This isn't Christian, I hope. Science is, you do this, you meet these conditions, and this happens. Mrs. Eddy has so many conditional sentences in Christian science, where she says, in Science and Health, where she says, do this, and this happens. Well, let's put that into practice. Let's put together, we need this much stuff. Why? Because we're trying to change the world. Who wouldn't want to be part of that? Wow, have I gone off my script here. <laughs> it happens frequently. Just ask Sabrina. So let me come back for just a minute. What are our big problems here? Operationally, nothing. The one hole is fundraising. I've already mentioned that. Great. The other issue that we have, it's not so much something we're doing wrong, we just aren't doing it. And that is, nobody knows who we are. I mean, you all know, awesome. You can tell people, Great, but when I was back at Principia three, four weeks ago, uh, they had just sent out, the Willis had just sent out an announcement that I was joining them. And I mean, I can't tell you how many, at least a dozen very good friends came up to me, very sad expression on their face. 
And Cain sort of pulled me aside and said, so I heard you're going to the Willows. Are you okay? <laughs> Their concern was that I had a physical problem that was debilitating. That's what they thought. I was able to correct that and let them know that that just wasn't so. And in fact, there are a whole bunch of people here who just are crazy and, and they love life. And, okay, maybe I use different words, but you get the idea. Um, and then they, they asked, so, what, you know, what do you have, five units, 10 units? No, there is so much ignorance uh, about what we are, who we are, how big we are, how successful we are. We need to change that. So that will happen. Um, I, I found it interesting that uh, previous speakers here today all sort of are dealing with this, the manna story, because I've been praying last night and that's what had come to me. And so I just want to think a little bit about what Moses sort of faced there, where he's trying to get to his goal of the promised land. He's got all these whiners with him who are constantly saying, oh, man, I'm so hungry. I'm so hot. You know, how long is this going to take? And I think, how long is it going to take? Because it ain't very far away. If you look physically. But they had to spend 20 years wandering around there because there are some people that didn't believe. So, okay, but they, they did have a complaint about the food, namely lack thereof, right? And so he prays and he gets an answer and they get manna in the morning and they get quail at night. Clearly worked really well for 20 years. I think the selection is a little boring after a while, but that's okay, you know, it worked. And I love that, that uh, each of us touched on this, Doug talking about day by day, the manna fell. And um, this is sort of what we're really looking at here, which is there is supply here. It's whatever we need. It will be sufficient. If we need a lot, it'll be there because every right idea brings its own supply. We don't have to go find it. It comes with the idea. It's part of being right. That's what we have to remember here. The right idea brings its own supply. So I want you to think about that. And there's one other thing that I want you to think about. And it's this last line. We want your prayers because they work. Because we have an expectancy of good. We don't have a hope of good. We don't have a wonder. We expect good. Why? Because this is a science. Again, do this, meet these conditions. This is what happens. Over and over again, meet these conditions, you get awesomeness. Okay, she didn't use that word, but that is what she meant. Because it is awesome. It is terrific. It is right. All of us have proved this. All of us have done this. All of us has experienced this. So let's be Christian scientists. Let's go out and demonstrate this. I am really looking forward to growing with all of you. This is just so cool. Thanks. Okay.
Nick wisely just suggested, let's take a three to five minutes standing break. Those of you that need to use the John, feel free. But Richard is going, then going to talk, and I, oh, whoa, 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 hang on. Okay. Okay. So, not a three-minute break. We're taking a 30-second break. Have I got to go ahead, Heidi? Okay. She's kind but ruthless. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Richard Davenport. After complete, so I've got a whole thing to read here, so just hang in there. After completing the Mother Church's three year chaplain training program, and a Master of Divinity degree at Boston University. Richard Davenport was endorsed into the United States Air Force by the Christian Science Board of Directors to serve as a Protestant chaplain. Their endorsement authorized him to, quote, perform the duties required of him as a chaplain, including necessary religious offices not inconsistent with the church manual. His two-decade ministry across three continents was recognized by the Air Force for its inclusivity, community building, progressive vision, and effectiveness with diverse audiences. The last two generals for whom he worked summed up his career with the following words. Stellar performer. Worked miracles. Most productive chaplain in the command. And he tells me there were at least one other. I think I'm going to get a, a slap back on that one. He sets the pace. A visionary who can get the job done and win friends in the process. So you can see they just thought he was a slacker. When Kim Charette wrote the book, Christian Science Military Ministry, 1917 to 2004, he dedicated full chapters to three chaplains, including Richard. Regarding Richard, he wrote, his career illustrates a well-thought-out Christian construct for living in community. His vision and its implementation changed the culture and the way individuals and groups related to one another. He practiced community building from a Christian basis where he was and continued to do so after leaving military service. But recently, Richard served on the Willows Foundation board until he and his wife moved in here and became residents this past summer. They remain active on the leadership team of both Next Generation Fellowship, a progressive trans-denominational ministry they were part of founding, and its sister ministry, First Church of Christ Scientist in Brentwood, Missouri. They have three adult children living nearby the Willows and are enjoying being active, I like that, active grandparents to their three young grandchildren. 
Richard's talk today is on newness and to our, large, our larger practicing of the core actions of the world's mission statement, grace-led, forward-thinking, and compassionate community. With that, please welcome Richard Davenport. Set this up. Oh, welcome. It's good to see you. I guess I should go through the same removal of whether they want to see me strapped to the podium. I guess I could walk over here and move out cut this way. I did notice this is better sound, I think, than your, than your speaker was. Is that what you were thinking? Okay, we'll do that. I have 153 pages here, so let me get on here. You think he's kidding. <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I've been in this room um, a lot since 2004 when I came here with a Bible conference. And I, uh, I've given a lot of talks here, including uh, the opportunity to speak to the annual meeting back in 2020, but I've never done it as a resident. And I'm deeply, deeply moved by uh, what it means to be a part of you, a Willowite. And I am certainly, as Jerry would attest to, we were two of those people um, a year ago that would have been stunned to find ourselves at the Willows. And now so very grateful that we, we are. And um, I just can't help myself anymore. I'm gonna put on my button. It's one of the first buttons I put, put together when I started speaking Christian science. It asks the truly profound question of all of our spiritual journeys. Have you hugged a Christian scientist today? So we're going to move. We're going to move forward with that. I do want to thank um, Heidi, Liana, Andre, Rick, and Jerry, my dear wife, for all the help with this event, the tech side of it. Um, thank you all in this room for being present, and for all of you on Zoom for joining us. Um, I would like to open with a song prayer. I'm going to play it for you here, just a moment. Um, for 14 summers, I organized and hosted an annual Bible and Spiritual Life conference for Christian scientists and their friends um, at the Sinclair State Park and Conference Grounds overlooking Monterey Bay in Central California. One summer, our musical director, someone you may know, longtime organist at 11th Church, John Gilmore, um, our musical director was teaching attendees to sing a four-part harmony to this sung prayer. And someone among us said, why don't we do a flash mob? Well, that really catches with a lot of Christian scientists. And uh, so we did. We went over the dining room lunch, stood up and did this spontaneous sharing. A lot of people really loved it. Um, it's a short, it's a short prayer. I'm going to ask you to listen to it. Because when we're done, I'm going to bring up Douglas Eastman, and he's going to lead us in the singing of this prayer. So let's hear it now.
All right, are you ready for it? Are you ready for Judge Rex? We're not ready for you yet. We put the words up here. There we go. I want to say if I could use one theme we try to read this talk together, it would be about the heart and the hearts that would pray daily, even sometimes moment by moment. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. We are here for God. Let's stand if you want to get a little more stretching. Uh, and uh, if you want to, or we can be seated. But Douglas, won't you come on up? We're going to sing it through twice. Spirit of Spirit of the Fresh on me, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh. Thank you, Douglas. Thank you, my goodness. Um, I love the spirit of living God, not the spirit of trying through or familiar patterns, talking about newness. I know how to do a lot of things. Can I continue to do those? Well, that may not be God's design. It may not be what the world cries out for. But it does start with this wonderful, wonderful community here at the Willows. Um, I could echo so many things in Steve's remarks, but none of them more than what a gift the Willows is and what a need it is for the rest of the world to see it. I, I did say with the world, not just the Christian science movement. As a city on a hill, there's a world here, I think, that is larger than maybe we've even begun to think of. And um, my talk is uh, today on Cox and Grace Led, Board Thinking, Compassionate Community. We have three art pieces out of our living room that are over here that represent to us the, um, both the idea of uh, being a grass led community, the center one, forward thinkers being the dancing ones on the left, and on the far right, the compassionate ones. Um, the good news here is that the Bible is really all about newness. God repeatedly in both Testaments talks about doing a new thing, singing a new song, creating a new heart, making a new creature, and establishing a new covenant, to make me in just a few. Rich actually got a number of them in the readings today. Newness requires change. Leaving the world for the new. And that kind of movement is not just for the people of younger years. It all, I read, in fact, wrote an article published in the journal 
on Abraham, who uh, left his father's house, who was an idol maker, interestingly, at the age of 70, his journey to where? No GPS, never saw a brochure, was no video available. He's just going to walk with God. I think someone would thinking something like that prayer. He wanted to be used by God and felt God had a calling for him. But to get there from here involved some melting, some molding. So people keep traveling in the Bible. In fact, it's kind of interesting things. When people aren't moving in the Bible, no one's writing anything. So a lot of what you got in the Bible is about the travels. And they're moving to higher ground. Wow, what a name for a ministry. <laughs> That's the name of my ministry. So if you didn't know that about me, you really do. A little commercial placement. Um, a high ground is a place of safety, of freedom, of growth, of service, and of even greater love. The heart of the Bible is the movement toward greater intimacy with God, not using God or religion to get what we want or think we need or deserve or have earned or could afford. I love an association address I heard this past fall. Uh, the teacher said, it's not about me-theism. Not about me working God. Trusting God is the only certainty, and God is in his charge. It is not about getting the objectives of our heart, but in lifting those objectives up so that, as in the words of our daily prayer, our affections are enriched. This is only uses some fascinating imagery for us in a moving article about money. It's simply titled An Allegory on page 323 of Miss Lane's writings. Maybe you're familiar with this. A stranger descends from the mountaintop to the valley below who invites people to ascend the mountain with him. Once down there, he gets a little challenged by what he's observing or what the material picture is. He sees a lot of folks intoxicated and attached to self-indulgence and dulling themselves. Still, some do join him for the climb. Do you recall what hinders their ascent? Baggage. I think we got a slide for that. Yeah, this is it. This, this was Jerry and I going through LAX, coming out way the way I was, that's what we were trying to get to. Um, my bondage. Um, we ask ourselves as we're moving forward, as we're preparing ourselves for the larger game of serving, blessing, and healing, what do I have in the way of luggage that I could dispense with? What needs to go? Uh, you really carried a few of these in the surveys that you took last summer. And it comes out in conversations um, that have been had by staff with you over the last few minutes. One extra piece of luggage might be, when you your words, gossip. It might be judgment. It might be moral affections. The stranger deals with that and observes it. Our little writes, many there were who had entered the valley to speculate in worldly policy, religion, politics, finance, and to search for wealth and fame. These had heavy baggage of their own and insisted on taking all of it with them, which must greatly hinder their ascent. When come travelers halt and disagree, will be all those who have having less baggage ascend faster. Despite of being the same, loaded as they are, 
where you can learn to stop and lay down a few of the heavy weights. But when you take them up again, they're going to determine not to part with their baggage. This is one of the more pithy statements I've ever said, read from Mrs. Eddy. Obstinately holding themselves back and sore footed, they fall behind and lose sight of their guide. When stumbling and grumbling and fighting each other, they plunge headlong over the jagged rocks. That's pretty visceral, isn't it? So this idea of baggage is something that comes up a time and time again in, among spiritual thinkers of all brands. But there is one who has a lot of friends in our movement, even now years after his passing. Um, how many here are familiar with Peter Henniker Heaton? Yeah. Peter has a new book out about him. By Tim Shuett, called Peter Hunter Hinton, Man of Joy. He was a remarkable traveler who suffered an inability to move for almost an entire decade in the mid 20th century. He could not, for many years, even sit up. This included the time of the German bombing of London, where he and his wife Rose lived. Rose was a stellar character and an example in her own right. Not the least of which, this is recounted in the book, when the air raid sirens went off, they lived on the fifth floor of a building and she carried her husband down five flights of stairs to get him in the bomb shelter over and over and over again. Peter reflected on the lessons that he learned about moving. And two are worth repeating here. One is to expect the unexpected and leave all unnecessary baggage. His poetry and prose are some of the richest things that we have in the movement's history. Working with a home forum page for many years, uh, he did. He did. He was entirely healed, and just more so. You could see a heart set on fire in a man of joy. Now, in order to have necessary baggage, we might pick up some useful carry-ons, especially for the practicing community. There we go. Isn't that an interestingly diverse community. For instance, Jesus' example is one of inviting new people into the circle of his community. All of these were individuals and groups who were unclean to the Jews. And by coming in contact with them, they felt they would become unclean as well. Those who opposed him, and many who followed Jesus, were often more inclined to exclude people who weren't like them. My good friend and longtime speaking partner, Ellen Mathis, um, referred to this tension as being between practices like those of Paul, which were about opening doors. They branded themselves as door openers, and others who saw their role as gatekeepers. Now, frankly, in my experience, I don't believe any of us are 100% one, one or the other. We are a mix. Stephen Gottschalk, one of our deepest thinkers and most effective bridge builders to the rest of the world, used to say though that some terms could be retired. One of them was known scientists. Stephen said this was I don't like living in North Dakota and calling the rest of the world North Dakotans. Maybe a question. We need to get your other mic off. Oh, is it causing problems? 
Okay. That's okay. Um, a question for me to consider with the wills um, is to balance the pleasure of living with people who share our religion, such as we practice it. There are a lot of different ways we're seeing of how it's practiced. Like that, and we often refer to it as living with like-minded individuals. We do that without feeling attention. Some of you may have made a choice that is not what we would have made, or that we imagine we wouldn't have made in their circumstance. Maybe it's a question we could have more conversation with. I'll return to that a little bit later. What should be the basis of our sameness? What should be the landmarks of our journey today? Well, Rich already spilled the beans when he got into Mrs. Eddy's remarks about false landmarks. And um, we should have a slide up there with the quote. Pardon? I took it out. See, I was trying to make this shorter last night. Even then, I was anticipating. This day talks about false landmarks and um, gladness to see them disappear. And, and um, I will confess, I have had to learn and uh, pick up some new understanding about false landmarks in my journey. I think when I was younger, I associate false landmarks with evil landmarks. Like those jagged rocks that people are falling on in the allegory. Um, false landmark is not necessarily an evil thing. It just might be something that we've already arrived at. And therefore, it's not helping us move forward. Often false landmarks rest our gaze on yesterday's demonstration at the expense of today's. And here's what I was going to return to about the discussion um, about diversity and, and how we choose different paths. God chooses for us, for us different paths. I will remember a particular moment at last year's annual meeting, a uh, superb interview by David Cook of our current monitor editor, Mark Saffenfield. Mark pushed upon one view of medical science I found very arresting. And as an example, I think it's the sort of thing we could have an ongoing discussion about maybe here. Mark raised the question, could many of the conditions being healed in the chapter on fruitage in science and health be healed by medical science today? He said, yes. For more or less, he was changing landmarks right in front of us, saying something a friend about medicine. I was raised in a church culture that celebrated every medical failure as an affirmation of Christian science, <laughs> as the one true way. In context, many of the voices that I grew up with would have said, why would we affirm medicine's capacity? Mark explained it very well that in Mrs. Eddy's day, medical science was seen as being pretty totally incompetent. Today, however, he said, modern symptoms are often treated better by medicine. However, just as many reports and footage stress that while they were thankful for the physical healing, their greater cause for gratitude was frequently stated as a larger sense of God's love and presence. Perhaps we need to go back to the Bible. Because there are passages we don't often get in our big chunk read of the Bible. Jesus began to scroll in the cities in which he had done his greatest miracles because they didn't change their hearts and lives. 
Again, Jesus. But if the means, he tells two other cities, if the miracles done among you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have changed their hearts and lives. But I say to you, you will not be so honored or raised up into heaven because you haven't. Changing hearts and lives. There's a passage a few chapters earlier at the uh, end of the fourth chapter of Matthew, just as he's prepared to do the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus' first public words. Fortunately, in a lot of the old translations, it has the word repent. Newer translations don't use that. It uses the word change. Your hearts and lies. Here comes the kingdom of heaven. Are we ready for it? The country consumed with loneliness, anxiety, memory of oneself, with constant social media influences, chemicals, shopping, money, sex, power. Perhaps mental and emotional health, along with relationship and community wellness, receive more of our attention. He says words on page 444 of Science and Health have application far beyond the question of just physical health. God will direct you in the right use of temporary and eternal means. Back to the Bible on this. This is the, um, apparently considered the text of Romans 12, verses 1 and 2 as her second choice for the Quran of Scripture in our Sunday services, that which is ter ter uh, currently served by 1 John 3. I'm offering it now to you in a contemporary translation from, a tr from one that I grew up with, J.B. Phillips' New Testament. With eyes wide open to the mercies of God, I beg you, my brother, sisters and siblings, as an act of intelligent worship, to give him your bodies as a living sacrifice consecrated to him and accepted by him. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within so that you may prove in practice that the plan of God for you is good meets all his demands, and move towards the goal of true maturity. I like that a lot. I also like another reflection on what does true maturity look like? What does growth and grace look like when it's grown up? So here's... Part of what's happening right now in our society is a lot of sparks are coming off among religious thinkers. One of the reasons this influences us in our denomination as in any other, but a lot of people today are not wanting to make religious profession. What they want is a spiritual practice. They don't want to recite beliefs, and they frankly are not necessarily interested in hearing teachings about God. They want to experience God directly, powerfully. And I think that's very, very strong. Um, The city has this arresting passage, one of many, that um, seems germane to our consideration today. It's on page 365. If the unselfish affections be lacking and common sense and common humanity are disregarded, what mental quality remains with which to evoke healing from the outstretched arms of righteousness. What if the scientists 
reaches his patient through divine love, the healing work will be accomplished at will and visit. If the scientist has enough Christ's affection to win his own pardon, and such commendation as the Magdalene received from Jesus, he was Christian enough to practice scientifically and deal with his patients compassionately. You know, I have a contact at the Mary Baker Library who spent many years working in church archives and we've had a dialogue about things and I actually wrote him about this passage. I said, this discussion about reaching your patient through divine love, I said, you know, I don't hear a lot of talk about that. How come we don't talk about that more? How come Mrs. Eddie didn't say more about it? And the response was really interesting. He wrote, when Mrs. Eddie first started to teach, she found that a lot of her students, his language, did not have a sufficient enough understanding of the Holy Spirit's role in the work. And so she developed argument and reason and talks about them in science and health as well. Page 454, remember that the letter and mutual argument are only human auxiliaries to aid in human thought into accord with the spirit of truth and love, which heals the sick and the sinner. I mention this because I work with a lot of different, with a lot of different groups. And this is a big term today, and it flows from a sense of uniting in love. Um, I think we've got it coming up here on a slide on baptism, which is a new thing here. She writes this, the baptism of the Holy Ghost is a spirit of truth cleansing from all sin, giving mortals new motives, new purposes, new affections, all pointing upward. I think it's, it's interesting that there is such talk today about spirituality and uniting in love. If we could use the language Mrs. Eddy began with and said was the ultimate, talking more about our experiences with love, we would find a lot of the challenges in building bridges diminished. We would find common ground with a lot of people. Um, we show an example of how things have changed where people are talking less about religion and more about spirituality defined as where is my sense of purpose? Where's my identity? How do I connect to the universe, to the earth, to my family? What is it about my relationships that could be enriched? Talking about things that have to do with where's my creativity? How am I generative? That's just not about having kids. It's about bringing new things into the world, new ideas, new services. So this is the old chaplain seal that I entered the chaplaincy with in 1979. For years after I came in, as the religious complex of America shifted, we added... Um, a crescent for Islam. We added a symbol for Buddhism. We started adding religious symbols to, the, to that seal. Well, this is, what the, this is what the seal looks like today. What's different? There are no religious symbols. It's about spirituality. It's about encountering the divine about the many different ways people do this. Think of who they're trying to serve. I was with this group for a long time, mainly young people, most of whom have no religious background. They were told when they came in, the, when they came in as a young chaplain, they were told, the chaplain is your pastor in uniform. That doesn't mean anyone, anybody who doesn't have a pastor, I never knew one. And... Um, it just advises us to consider again, maybe 
we could do better and find a different way. And for that, we go back and reinvent things we've always known. Example, the woman at the well. Woman at the well, who is the first person in John's gospel that Jesus discloses himself to. You got to think about breaking old landmarks. Jesus tells her first, among all people, what his mission is. He hasn't told the Jews yet, but he's told them. On the way to the Jews, it comes across Roman centurion, who has a healing request for a, a servant. He heals him. So all this is going in front of Jesus, getting to the hometown crowd, and they're not too plus with the fact that he went to Samaria, which are the enemies of the Jews, and then he went to the occupiers of the Jew before he came to them. What's that about? Well, I'm going to put up a new statement about that woman's experience that I hope you might feel speaks to today. And I'm going to ask as, I, as it comes up, um, I'm going to ask if you would think to yourselves while you hear it, do I know anybody like this woman at the well? And if you don't, ask yourself this, among the younger people that you know in your life, how many of them know someone like her? Because that's really important as to whether or not they're going to come to be with us. I am a woman I of no distinction, of little importance. I am a woman of no reputation, save that which is bad. You whisper as I pass by and cast judgmental glances, though you don't really take the time to look at me or even get to know me, for to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known, and otherwise, what's the point in doing either one of them in the first place? I want to be known. I want someone to look at my face and not just see two eyes, a nose, a mouth, and two ears, but to see all that I am and could be, all my hopes, loves, and fears. That's too much to hope for, to wish for, or pray for, so I don't, not anymore. Now I keep to myself, and by that I mean the pain, pain that keeps me in my own private jail, the pain that's brought me here at midday to this well. To ask for a drink is no big request, but to ask it of me, a woman unclean, ashamed, used and abused, an outcast, a failure, a disappointment, a sinner. No drink passing from these hands to your lips could ever be refreshing, only condemning, as I'm sure you condemn me now, but you don't. You're a man of no distinction, though of the utmost importance, a man with little reputation, at least so far. You whisper and tell me to my face what all those glances have been about, and you take the time to really look at me, but don't need to get to know me for to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And you know me, you actually know me, all of me and everything about me, every thought inside and hair on top of my head, every hurt stored up, every hope, every dread, my past and my future, all I am and could be. You tell me everything, you tell me about me. And that which is spoken by another would bring hate and condemnation. Coming from you brings love, grace, mercy, hope, and salvation. I've heard of one to come who would save a wretch like me. And here in my presence, you say I am he. To be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And I just met you, but I love you. I don't know you, but I want to get to. Let me run back to town. This is way too much for just me. There are others, brothers, sisters, lovers, haters, the good and the bad, sinners and saints, who should hear what you've told me, who should see what you've shown me, who should taste what you gave me, who should feel how you forgave me. For to be known is to be loved, and to be loved is to be known. And they all need this too. We all do need it for our own. Wow. What do you think? I have no doubt that Jesus beheld in her the perfect person. But what he said to her was basically, I see you, I'll tell you what you've done, and I love you. That's what really drew her in. And just like a lot of our young friends, they will go with their friends, to their friends. She went to the village and brought them out. Jesus stayed there quite a while. And I think it's, it's, it's indicative of the question of how do we have a message, a heart, that will draw people to what we know to be so very precious? 
and will help us refine our own challenges sometime at practicing, um, especially at seeing the progress we like to see. Most younger people, I'll say the pre AARP crowd, um, would be reluctant to identify with a church very few of our friends would be uncomfortable with. That can be true about our own children. And so just one example, kind of stretch this out. Um, LGBTQ identification by generation in this, this came out in, um, we could go Friday's USA Today, a national study titled Gen Z is driving an LGBTQ identity. I'm pretty current with a lot of stuff that is stunned by the statistics. 2.7 identify with LGBTQ, 2.7%. Millennials, 3.3%. Um, millennials, Gen Z. So I got those back. Boomers, 2.7. Xers, 3.3. Millennials, 11.2. And then there's Gen Z, the generation born between 1997 and 2004. Almost 19.7% identify as LGBTQ. And of that group, and in many cases, some of their, their parents, the millennials, um, two-thirds of those that do identify as LGBTQ, almost two-thirds, identify as bisexual. But just to say, kind of, if we can't have an understanding of the grudging tolerance of sexual diversity, which others feel, even if we don't say it, we're not really going to be in a, in a good place. That's just an example of one piece of a false landmark. The landmark is getting ripped up around Christianity today just to let you know, it isn't just us. It's saying that basically the Christian church has not said what it wants from us as heterosexuals. It tends to tell us two things, as the kids say, as we hear it. It certainly is what I heard about sex. Two things about sex. Don't have it before you're, you're married, and we should look about it. We don't want to hear it. Um, it's really, it's really, really true. Now, we're going to um, go on and look with the grace led community and look at this picture. Done by, by the way, by a Southern California artist named John August Swanson. I got to know him, and um, you'll see over here on the, the painting, he had done a bunch of red marque on the bottom for us. And I love talking to him in his, in his home, and he, he uses this picture to illustrate. The base led life. This is what he calls the prodigal son, the pearl of the parables. The prodigal son wanted to be seen. Who else in the story does? Well, the story about the prodigal son is kind of a, a misnomer, or at least it seems to be at times, because the, the guy, the young son who takes the wealth and goes off and squanders it, does all these things comes home repentant and is reconciled to his father and goes into a party. Who's missing? The older one, the elder son. And it's hard because a lot of us at this point in our life may identify more with the, the elder son. Who chairs the executive committee at the local synagogue is, you know, does all the right things. But it comes out in his dialogue with his dad that he actually wants the same thing as his younger brother did. He wants dad's money. But he won't repent, he won't turn, he won't shift, he won't be remolded. And he's left, and one of the biggest question marks I have in the Bible is, whatever happened to this guy in the story? He doesn't go into the party, he's not reconciled to his father, he's separated from his brother. But if you don't move to a new slide, I'm going to bring up to you that helps us folks maybe a little bit more on this. It's a cartoon. If you can't read it, some of you may be on the Zoom. Um, 
Jesus is here talking to a group of sad-faced Bible bearers and says that the difference between me and you is you use scripture to determine what love means. And I use love to determine what scripture means. There's, there's a lot to say about taking the Jesus lead on things like this. Um, we, we use the term of him to describe him as exemplar. He certainly is. But to Mary Dick Reddy, her language for him is far, far more deep and varied. The poem, Saw Ye My Savior. Have you ever known anybody in the movement who referred to him as their savior that way? Maybe a few. It's not a language we tend to use. And another question. I have a lot of questions. That's part of what we're trying to do here. Ask questions. Um, I'm always drawn to things Mary Baker did only once, but she made no efforts to try and cover it up. Only once did she say the very same sentence to the very same audience within a 12-month period and publish it twice. Know what I'm talking about? Follow your leader only so far as she follows Christ. So I ask questions. I says, why'd she do that? Why'd she repeat herself? She doesn't do it often. And I don't know the answer. Did perhaps she feel she wasn't heard? Um, I think it might have been that it made a more repetition to her. I do know that what she didn't say was, and this sometimes has been a question, she did not say, follow Christ only so far as he follows your leader. Bible is the supreme authority. Christ is the example. The sixth tenet says we're to pray for the mind of Christ. And Jesus is actually the interpretive lens for looking at Scripture. This might help bring some Scripture more alive to you. It certainly did to me. But basically what you do is you submit Scripture through the interpretive lens of Jesus. Richard Rohr, who's an author and writer that many of you know for many years, um, is a Franciscan. And he writes such poignant stuff. One of the statements he made at a conference I was at a while back says, I can't believe how much we make out of things Jesus never spoke of and how little we make of the things that he did. So that gets into the idea of where do some of our false landmarks come from. Here's an example. Where did the sinless come from? The sinless for admittance. But they haven't gone on a list that such a list, as it usually is formed out, excludes Mrs. Eddy from membership. Yeah. And employment, things are changing. Things are changing. Um, did Jesus talk about any things on our list? Smoking, drinking, um, medical reliance, you know. Um, you know, if we ever did talk about Jesus' themes, not that he ever, ever, ever never educated, <laughs> never indicated that we should come up with a sin list, but we learned with some different answers. What did Jesus talk most frequently about in his parables? First comment was it? money, your relationship with money. The prodigal son talks about money. The good Samaritan talks about money. You go on and on. It's a very predominant firm. Um, I remember a town hall meeting with the Christian Center's Board of Directors maybe 11, 12 years ago. And then in the QA, a woman in late 20s asked about why we weren't holding the standards more rigorously. One um, of the directors made the comment that he was wondering if we have the right standards. And uh, he said, I wonder about that a lot. 
He said, I wonder about things like um, perfidy. He said he has a whole article about perfidy. And I thought, well, she does. Do you know what perfidy means? Perfidy means breaking of a trust. It relates well to the concept of gossip and slander. And Mrs. Eddy has some pretty poignant comments on this. It's on page 226 of Miscellaneous Writings. She says, perfidy of an inferior quality, such as Moses to obey the law, in which dignifies natures, cannot stoop to notice, except literally, disgraces human nature more than the most vices. Slander is a midnight robber. That's interesting. Would we come up with a different set of, 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 of behaviors, of practices, if that were the case? I say this also to, to, to remind you again that we have a lot of allies. I, I have had wonderful relationships with people from very different backgrounds. We go to the next slide. This was a magazine that uh, asked me if I would write an article for them. This is the number one uh, natural foods, healthy lifestyle magazine in the country. It's printed locally. Um, but the content comes from a central location. They asked me to write this um, article, Awakening to Spirit, Prayer and Meditation, Heal and Free Us. A lot of the people, a lot of the people um, struggle with uh, the Bible who are reading this magazine. They struggle with God. They struggle with rules. They struggle with judgment. And so writing something about prayer and meditation that wasn't like that was a great opportunity. I've had numerous opportunities like this that just tell me that people want to listen if we're willing to also. Um, here's, here's the question. I'm coming up to my last page. How about that? It's a six point point, so I'm gonna read it small. Um, <laughs> there's a question behind all this. Um, this will be on the compassionate community. We read a passage, Matthew 5, 48. Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. And one of the changes we have is we define perfect the way we think of perfect. The actual meaning of the word, because it wasn't really it's like First Genesis 1, 26 to 31. It wasn't really a word for God saw everything he had made and it was perfect. They had no word for that in their language. Perfect is really fine. It wasn't yet there. But what they talked about in Greek, uh, when they wrote it in Greek, was um, whole, integrated, balanced, complete. And there is another statement of this in Luke 6, 36. It reads across translations, be compassionate as your Father in heaven is compassionate. Um, that's a really important theme. Compassion means from your Latin roots to suffer with. And it has a wonderful phrase. It's used 12 times in the Gospels, referring either to God or Jesus. Um, it talks about the deep feelings that they had about something, including compassion. And it, it shows that it was a deep thing. We have often sold Jesus short for the fact that he could feel such deep things. I've heard people explain away the shortest sentence in the Bible, Jesus wept at Lazarus' funeral, as if he was just maybe wanting to show the people that he cared. That's not the Jesus revealed in the language of the New Testament. Um, it is something important to know that Jesus had feelings and struggled too, which makes him the exemplar. Um, I don't want to put myself up against someone who's so fundamentally different than, than me. The New Testament says he was tempted in all ways such as are we. Sometimes this gets really out of hand. Um, 
And it's, uh, we had a situation in Texas when I was working down there at the time when Camille's publication um, were um, uh, sending out speakers from local branch churches to talk to groups. We had a, somebody want to hear a talk on um, uh, Christian science. And so someone was going to, to a local Methodist church to talk to an adult group about Christian science. And he was asked, do Christian scientists think Jesus struggled or hurt on the cross? And the, yeah, the man who was speaking, he was trying to reconcile this with Jesus as a good practitioner. He wouldn't break a sweat. So he told the audience, we believe he was made and uncomfortable. And, and indeed, the, um, the COP sent back a corrective speaker for the corrective speaker. But um, I think we have um, a summary here. But I'm going to show you one more thing. I'm going to show the, the video, the, the church video. I'm going to ask you to do something I asked you to do a little bit earlier, but now we're going to do it more keenly. This church group, not a Christian science group, made this about overcoming questions they've been, that they'd heard people ask them about joining church, reasons people don't go to church. And some of their words will be different than the ones we would choose. I'm going to ask you to try and look through those words at what the sentiment is they're trying to get to so we don't get stuck in different language. Because believe me, they struggle with us. So we'd like them to look through what we're saying to what we're reaching towards. But see what you think of this. Here's a few reasons why people don't go to church. I can't come to church until I get my life together. Church is how I got my life together. Church is filled with a bunch of hypocrites. And there's always room for one more. All they care about is your money. They care about me, not about my money. Is there some kind of dress code? Yes, the code is wear some clothes. Church, it just makes me nervous. I was nervous at first, and then I felt right at home. I'm not sure I believe everything that you believe. But you can still belong. Church is for wimpy, girly men. You want to say that again? If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't want me. If you knew me and what I've done, you wouldn't be worried. You can come to my church even if you were brought up Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Jewish, Mormon, Lutheran, Pentecostal, Presbyterian, Church of Christ, Southern Baptist, a little bit of everything and a whole lot of nothing. See, it's not about a religion, it's about a relationship. So please, come to my church. Where nobody's perfect. Where beginners are welcome. Where socks are optional, but grace is required. Where forgiveness is offered. Where hope is alive. And where it's okay to not be okay. Really. That pretty powerful, huh? That last statement, where it's okay not to be okay. Many churches, Philip Yancey talked about this in his writing. Um, many churches have a church that follows that it's in the basement. It's the 12-step group. When you come, the first thing you do is you say, I don't have it all together. And you instantly belong. Where so often the church upstairs requires you to look like you have it together and maintain that look before you really belong. So I'm gonna um, wrap this up. Grace Jones is um, where we move forward. We're working with this. This is my blog, actually. 
can find my blog on Facebook. Um, you can also find um, this on the internet, Jesus Pattern Spirituality. Jesus Pattern Biblical Spirituality.org. This was our nonprofit. Um, these were the themes of reimagining community, reconstructing faith, restoring hope, renewing love. And we have a on there the stream that we last did. Um, this Barry Huff, you'll know Barry was there. Three women who are all pastors, um, wonderful next generation thinkers. And we had this carried actually to every um, continent, including Antarctica. We had the scientific research station down there listening in. So much of this is, is powerful. So much of this is true. This verse here, what does the Lord require of you but to act justly, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God? So much is none of this happens in your head. It happens in your life. These are all options. And I learned that because as a Jewish tradition, it was about action. And I'll close with this. This is from um, a black woman mystic. We are not alone in this world. We have ever been. No matter how much we may feel otherwise, we have come before us and will come after us in the same way, seeking as are we, searching for the light. And as we come together, one by one, two by two, and on the moon, that we form the convergent tributaries that make up the mainstream stream of just and righteous people flowing home to God. We are in the justice that rose down the corner, but righteousness that flows like a mighty stream. And then she quotes black scientist George Washington Carver, who stressed that, quote, how far you go in this life depends on you being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong. Because someday in life, you will have been all of these. The river is still flowing, she says. We can accept the grace to be part of that flow if we truly are to be followers of Christ, imitators of him, then we must leap with faith into that torrent, knowing that we are in the bosom of God, our creator, our sustainer, our liberator, our mother and father. Thank you.